Well, I remember walking into the room that night filled with anxiousness. Everyone had gathered to learn and hear the results and to either celebrate or grieve together. And the atmosphere was tense. My friend who had hosted had some light snacks, but people weren't very interested in that. Truly, it wasn't a really festive mood. Instead, everyone was clustered right in front of the TV, and you could read the nervous energy on their faces. There had been months and months of buildup to this moment, and we were all ready just to hear the final results. You could tell the room was divided, half on one side, half on the other, which mirrored the broader cultural divide that existed during the whole season with such highly divided public opinions over who would win. And the nonstop ads and headlines made it a constant cultural conversation, so you couldn't help but get sucked into people wanting to talk about it all the time. I personally had stake in the game, too, because this was the first time I'd been a part of voting, so it wasn't just an opinion that I had. I actually represented myself officially on the national scale. And so I sat in front of the TV along with everyone else, nervously awaiting the final results, wondering, are we going to remain civil no matter what happens? And eventually the moment came, and the final tabulation of numbers and the results we'd been waiting with such anticipation for, such expectation, and the announcement came. It was Kelly Clarkson. She won. (laughs) The first season of American Idol was complete right? (laughs) Where's the Justin fans in here? In many ways, you guys, I know we're heading into this fall season with similar anticipation, full of anxious expectation and questions like, will this voting season rip our nation apart? Will the events of this coming fall catastrophically fracture our cultural landscape, which is already cracked? How do we relate with people who so boldly and without tact bash our viewpoints and our beliefs? How do we coexist with people who stand so vehemently against our values and our convictions that we cling to? Y'all, this past year, I've had the opportunity to take part in a learning community of about 30 people of various walks of life up in Dallas and representing a wide spectrum of spiritual and religious backgrounds. Most of these other participants have found themselves a number of steps down a pathway of deconstructing what they believe about the government maybe or the educational system or the family unit. And the big whopper is so many of these wonderful people have incredible spiritual hurt or disappointment. And they're wrestling through that in this environment. Now, you guys can believe that the conversation has gotten rough a number of times. I've gotten to listen to people repeatedly bash the Christian church in general and badmouth pastors, mock the very way of life that I take part in, even treating as ridiculous some of the beliefs and convictions that I maintain and and hold to as essential in my heart and soul. And I promise there's been repeated opportunities for me to get my feelings hurt, to jump to reactivity, to want to get back at someone with my own words, or to shut down emotionally, maybe run away or quiet quit this kind of community. But instead, God has said to me over and over again, Scott, I want you to lean in. I want you to remain. I want you to practice listening to these folks right now, even when it's hard, especially when it's hard, actually. I want you to learn to hold dissenting opinions in your hands without over-personalizing them and practice feeling curious enough to dig deeper and care about other people's perspectives even learning to appreciate their differences. Y'all, we've been saying it all month. The temperature, it's heating up out there. And even as the literal weather in Texas cools, we know our cultural climate is on a warming cycle. And political and racial and economic and spiritual cultural divides, they're all getting dangerously hot. There's incredible dissent and discord all around us, and that leaves us sometimes, those of us following Jesus, somewhere in the middle, pulled one way or pulled the other way, and unsure of how to relate to the world around us. 
Clearly, the same kind of division also exists within the body of Christ. And as Christ followers, we can find ourselves sometimes at odds with one another, bickering or infighting with other people, placing our identities in very earthly things and parties and causes, or judging and looking down on others, even reveling and calling other people wrong, or detaching and distancing from other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why this series has been so critical for us, to engage in a church-wide conversation about ourselves as kingdom citizens. And that's why we started looking at our kingdom priorities the first week, considering where does our true allegiance lie. And then in the second week, we looked at our kingdom perspective. What's our relationship with the government? And what does God want our response to be to established authority in our lives? Last week, we looked at our kingdom practice. What do we stand for, and how do we stand for those things, like with our posture, our approach, and our tone? And so our focus today is on how do we treat each other. What does the Bible say for the ways that followers of Jesus relate together? How do we communicate and live in unity? How can we as Christians relate to one another in a winsome way? that reflects unity and love to a watching world. Put simply, our aim today is to learn to identify ourselves more as kingdom people. We're going to find direction and inspiration in Scripture as we look together at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, where Paul lays out for followers of Jesus how we should carry ourselves, how we should live, and how we should treat one another. So let's read these verses together. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So a couple of quick notes right here at the beginning. First, it's really good that we're returning to the book of Ephesians because Paul wrote this letter to a church in Ephesus that was a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, blue collar and white collar, folks from a religious background and others who were brand new to the faith. If any audience could understand the challenge of unity in times of discord, it was the church in Ephesus. From the rest of Paul's writings to them, it's clear they really needed teaching and equipping on how to live together, how to relate to one another. So it's perfect for our discussion today. And also, we're about to start a new series on the front half of the book of of Ephesians. We're going to look at chapters 1, 2, and 3 starting next week at our identities in Christ, and how he's working in us and through us to produce genuine life. You won't want to miss this next series as we move from this month looking at our very externalized lives relating to other people to moving inward to look at how God is at work to define and shape us from the inside out. So looking back at our verses today, it's clear that Paul is calling us to a better way of living. He he uses that term urge, pleading with us. He's saying, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling. He's insisting that we change the pattern of this world that's attempting to shape our behavior and that we choose to walk in a different manner. In a pretty parallel passage in Colossians 3, Paul uses very similar language, but he uses the words put on with a list of character qualities, just like we put on clothes before going out to live our day. And so between these two images, walk like this and put on these garments, it's clear that God's trying to model for us exactly how we should get ready each day to face the outside world how we should gear up for the day ahead. Scripture tells us that we have to vitally prepare for that. And so we're going to see five major ways that Paul describes how we should walk, five different preparations we make for the journey. So let's look for those again in our passage. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, 
eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So as we break this passage down, here's the first major dynamic that characterizes our walk, the way that we treat each other and carry ourselves out in the world. He says it this way, that kingdom people reflect humble attitudes. Humility. We talked about this one last week a little bit. It's not a very highly valued quality in our American culture today. We're in the midst of a world of talking ourselves up and bending truth and facts to feel like we're always hashtag winning, of presenting ourselves with swagger and confidence where we brag and we boast and we chase the spotlight, seeking clout from other people, even internet strangers sometimes. For me, humility has always been one of my highest values that I see in other people and myself. And it goes back to one of my longtime friends and mentors, one of my first bosses named Chris Cooper, who modeled humility so well. Every time he dodged the spotlight or refused to get into the center of attention, instead, he would seek out the least desirable task that needed to be done in every moment. He was okay even as the head of a large organization taking out the trash when the cans were getting full so that the rest of the team could keep doing their thing. Now, typically, we define humility as not thinking too highly of yourself, right? And then to clarify, it's not only really just thinking less of yourself. Some people say it this way, that it's more thinking of yourself less, Because really, thinking too lowly of ourselves can actually almost become the same type of thing. It can be motivated and fueled by pride. I would say, by contrast, real humility is taking ourselves out of that tempting and really comfortable spot in the center of the universe. That's what humility looks like. Remember Philippians 2, we looked at it last week. When Paul tells us, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count yourselves or count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on and on to describe what Jesus experienced when he came from heaven and took on flesh and emptied himself, at least partially, of the fullness of Godhood in order to become a man. Now, theologians refer to this process as the divine kenosis, coming from the Greek word kenoo, which is to empty out. This kind of humility modeled by Jesus was himself emptying out the fullness of glory that he could expect, choosing to let it go partially and temporarily for the benefit and the sake of others. And that's something we can emulate, you guys. I can practice emptying myself of my own entitlement to glory, letting go of expectations that other people need to prioritize me and my thoughts and feelings and my wants and desires and rights. They are not paramount priority in the bigger picture of things. The parallel passage we looked at last week was Luke 9.23. Remember that one? Where Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You see that same principle of humility at play there? In that practice of daily denial, taking up your cross and dying to entitlement that that everything is about you. And denial of rights, I know, is a pretty hot-button issue today in our political landscape. We end up picking battles and fighting over our entitlements to our freedoms or our own autonomy, (coughs) to our material things. And I want you to hear this. The heart of God for you is not to overwhelm or eradicate your freedoms. But there are more important things at play. Just because I have a right doesn't mean that it's always best for me to exercise it. Some of our rights to feel comfortable at all times or to be always correct in every disagreement or to be able to live exactly the way that I want to live or always get the last word in. Some of these are rights that we don't have to exercise. 
Now, I bet most of us can recognize humility also in its absence, in the opposite kind of behavior, because we've seen lots of people in the world, and even Christians in the church, acting self-centered, seeking their own best interests, boasting about themselves or their lives, overly self-assured, crusading out of self-righteousness, instead of trying to understand other people's perspective, going out seeking to prove a point all the time. Instead of a posture of, what can I learn from this other person? It's a mentality of, how can I get my great wisdom across to them? And so for us as kingdom people, we practice getting low, putting on a more humble posture. Don't forget in our Ephesians passage, Paul says to walk in all humility. So this isn't false humility, you know, like humble bragging or trying to sound really lowly while masking a bunch of ego under the surface. True humility isn't short summoned or temporary. It's nurtured, it's cultured and cultivated across your life. It grows to truly characterize you. So when someone looks at you, humility just radiates out from you. Now let's go back to our Ephesians passage where we're reminded to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness. You see that? That's our, our next point today. Kingdom people remain gentle under stress. Gentleness. <laughs> I know some of you in the room are already emotionally recoiling from that word. Because like humility, gentleness is not highly valued in our culture. It's nothing that we put on a pedestal. Some of you hear the word gentleness as weakness, you know? Gentleness is related to impotence, an inability to engage or rise to what's needed in a situation. And I know some of you are wired as fighters, your voices carry, your footsteps echo when you walk down the hallway announcing your arrival. You make amazing coaches and cheerleaders in the stands at your kids' games. You know that the world has underdogs out there, and some of you are the first to stick up for the underdog and to fight for them. I see you, and I appreciate you, but what if I suggested to you today that true strength doesn't always lie in displays of power. True strength often shows up in restraint, in holding back power or destructive potential, and choosing to apply it only in places where it's most appropriate and called for. The Greek philosopher Aristotle, he distinguished between once what he termed excessive anger against everyone on all occasions, and then on the other side, never being angry with anything. And Aristotle actually put gentleness dead in the middle there. He talked about it being when we find ourselves appropriately aroused to deal with a situation as needed without any excess in our response. So if we look at that term gentleness in Ephesians, Commentator Harold Honer says it this way. He says, this term is used of the taming and training of animals. For instance, controlled by the master's will, a well-trained dog is always angry at the master's foes and never angry at the master's friends. Only the person who is controlled by the Spirit of God can truly be gentle, angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time. When such a person is wronged, he or she does not seek revenge. But when a wrong has been committed toward the brother or sister or the body of believers, he or she has the power to address the situation. Let's not forget the biblical foundation for gentleness is a defining characteristic of God's people. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that blessed are the meek. And then he describes himself in similar terms in Matthew 11 when he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that perfect combination of humility and gentleness that we see combined in, in our Savior and don't forget, lest you think that Jesus was a, a pushover. Remember his confrontation with the money changers in the temple courts? 
as Devo would say, crack that whip. Many years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah, he wrote about the future Messiah before he even knew the name Jesus. Look at this incredible prophecy I want to show you from Isaiah about the Savior sent to redeem humanity and how he would carry himself and behave. Isaiah 42 says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. And then again, a, a few chapters later in chapter 53, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Did this mean Jesus was weak? No. His strength was found in his choice of action and in his restraint. Gentleness is not the lack of power. It's the ability to use it wisely. And this isn't one of those things that only Jesus could practice. We can too. You and I, we can exemplify the same kind of gentle treatment of each other, especially in an environment of stress and tension. The more charged the cultural environment, the more urgently we need gentle treatment of one another. Or we could go the other way because we see the opposite of gentleness all around us treating each other using brutal methods or words with sarcasm or a biting tone, having harsh, critical spirits, steamrolling over people, leaving behind a wake of destruction in the people around you, or going even the total opposite direction, withdrawing your voice or your emotional presence from a relationship and stonewalling, which is passive aggressive. This is no more gentle. It's actually just as harsh in a different way. Truly, even with the body of Christ, the community of Jesus' followers, misdirected strength will only continue to create mess and hurt and damage. Whereas gentleness works in the other direction, protecting and guarding relationships and leaving room for the Holy Spirit to do his work. So let's re return to Ephesians 4 where Paul continues with all humility and gentleness, and with patience. You see that? That leads us right to our next point, that kingdom people demonstrate patience when provoked. I wonder, do you consider yourself a very patient person? Perhaps, have you seen yourself change in this? Either you've grown more patient over the years as you've gotten more wisdom and maturity, or maybe factors in your life have gone the other way and made you less patient. I like to think of patience as delaying a reaction. It's like adding wick to a stick of dynamite, lengthening the fuse that leads to the bomb. You know what I'm talking about? Meaning it will last longer before it blows up. And in these times, you and I were living like sticks of dynamite in a boiler room. There's lots and lots of opportunities for us to exercise patience with each other. Years ago, I had a beautiful cat named Mary J. Blige. She was awesome, <laughs> awesome, awesome. She was a, a rag doll breed, if you've ever heard of that, which meant she put up with anything. Like I could throw her in the air and catch her, and she would just lie there like she was on Kitty Xanax. Once I got a, a new puppy, uh, Oliver, a little puppy guy who I still have, he's in our family now, but he loved playing with Mary J in the backyard. I would look out the patio doors and I would see this little guy pulling this adult cat by the nape of her neck across the grass, this way and then that way, like she put up with anything. She would never hiss or claw or bite back. Now, I'm not advocating for that kind of extreme level of patience. That's kind of passivity, isn't it? It's still inspiring, though. I would say, biblically, patience has always been a defining characteristic of God. All through the Old Testament, time and time again, as his people rebelled against him and strayed unfaithfully from the Lord, behind the scenes, God is staying his wrath, 
over and over and over again. He chooses to remain patient and long-suffering despite deeply personal injustices being performed against him. It's the same God who tells us in James 1, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Slow to anger. That's that idea of lengthening the fuse, right? Being quick to listen. That means when someone says something offensive, I need to slow my roll before I just react. When I feel provoked, I need to pause and think before jumping on social media to rage post. I need to ask, Lord, would you reveal a wider perspective to my mind and to my heart right now? Would you help me to see beyond my own point of view in this moment? That's patience. Not so many years ago, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. led a movement that fundamentally changed our nation and our culture. And at the root of that movement was a heart of patience. MLK's fight for civil rights was decisively marked by nonviolence, a determination to resist any kind of forceful reaction to being provoked while he and his colleagues pushed for social reform. This was especially put to the test in 1955 during the Montgomery bus boycott when King faced threats on his life and even the bombing of his own home. And yet he chose not to react, not to respond in kind, not to get revenge. He considered this principle of nonviolent resistance, which was truly an expression of biblical patience, to be the guiding light of his civil rights movement. And it set things into motion that have changed our culture at the core. I know there's still so much work to do, but the fruit of King's work is so demonstrable. Of course, our broader culture, even beyond civil rights, demonstrates the other side of the spectrum from patience. You don't have to look far to see people behaving reactively, constantly short-fused, explosive in language and action, and turning cranky and crusty instead of remaining pliable and flexible. We try to maintain the right to cop a defensive and quick-tempered attitude. And when there's a hint of disagreement, we refuse to listen, and we talk over others and dominate conversations. Is that patience? Mm -mm. Instead, imagine the body of Christ, the Christian church, going out into the world, modeling patient, listening ears, turning the other cheek, and allowing emotional volatility to simmer down before responding. What a difference that would make on the landscape of our day and age. Back to our key passage in Ephesians. Let's see where Scripture takes us next. After humility, gentleness, with patience, Paul says, bearing with each other, with one another, in love. Which takes us to our next point today. Kingdom people bear with one another, with each other, out of love. What does it mean to bear with each other in love? Maybe you sometimes find yourself saying, bear with me. Have you ever said that in conversation? Especially if you're maybe having trouble getting the words out or getting your point across. Or maybe you feel like you're slowing someone down or having trouble with something. So you say, bear with me, right? It's as if you're saying, please stick with me. Don't walk away. Don't, don't give up on me. You know that situation where you've like asked someone their name and they've given it to you two or three times and you still didn't get it and you have to ask for it again? That's when you say, hey, bear with me. Can you just say it one more time? I hate those moments. That's the idea, though, of this. The actual dictionary term is forbearance. And it means not giving up quickly, being willing to endure something negative or undesirable, and being unwilling to give up or sever a relationship when things go less smoothly. Within the Christian community, that means we decide intentionally, I'm going to put up with other people's insufficiencies, other people's flaws, the things about them that annoy me. That's bearing with each other because you're gonna do things that I don't always love. You may talk or communicate in a way that I don't share or appreciate. You might have a different style of handling situations from me. 
You don't have to be the same as me. It's okay. I'm not going to give up on you or cut ties with you just because I don't agree. In a way, you could almost call this concept by something that's a bit of a buzzword today, but I think it really fits. Because truly, from a biblical definition perspective, bearing with each other is the same idea as tolerance. Yes, I know modern day culture has confused the term, watered it down to basically meaning letting anything go and letting anything slide, no matter whether we agree that it's right or wrong. But I'd say the purest version of the term tolerance means I give you space to operate differently from me. And I don't walk away when our methodologies don't overlap perfectly or when our viewpoints clash a little bit. I remain committed to you. In today's political cultural landscape, that also means just because I'm really passionate about a particular issue doesn't mean that if other people don't match and meet my passion that they're ignorant or morally deficient or less than. It means I'm going to choose love for the other person, feeling love and also extending love through my actions and words. And do that over prioritizing my own satisfaction or my own comfort. Jesus talks about that kind of love in John 13, what Simon read for us earlier, when Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. See that? The kind of love that comes from Jesus, which he modeled for us, he also expects us to show each other. Love like this, look at this, love like that seeks God's will for the other person, not my own agenda. And if I want to see God's will accomplished in somebody else, I'm going to have to stick it out with them and endure and love them even through disagreement. Now, I know we know the opposite. How do people walk out relationships over time in our world? Ugh, we see disloyalty, we see unfaithfulness, backstabbing other people in order to get ahead. We see people being flighty and undependable, even flaky. If I see you having a problem, I'm so likely to just leave you in it and say, that's your issue, not mine, instead of moving toward each other and saying, I wanna shoulder this burden with you. Or maybe the relationship never even gets into the deep end because instead of bearing with each other through realness, it just becomes easier to avoid real issues and be superficial or fake. Instead, I would say true forbearance. It's not a conditional self-serving kind of love. It's a true loving endurance based on the love of Jesus, the free, gracious love that emanates from him. So let's try to practice that with each other. Now you remember our passage in Ephesians had one more important component. And at the end there, Paul says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So here we see our final point, that kingdom people preserve unity as a priority. The first term that we see there is that eager, right? Eager means we're not doing it begrudgingly. We're not forced to do this. We really want it. I picture like the kid in the parking lot outside Disney World. He's eager to get inside. Or the groom at the front of the church, eager for the ceremony to begin. A business CEO on the eve of her retirement. How do we feel about unity? We should be pursuing unity with that level of excitement. And then notice that Paul says we have to maintain unity. Kind of like that physics concept of entropy. Don't let me lose you. That idea that unity, like matter or energy, will fade over time. It will fracture if left to its own devices. Instead, you and I, we have to nurture it. We have to maintain it. Like when we go to tune up a car or an HVAC unit during the summer. We have to do check-ins. We have to give it some TLC to keep it healthy and strong and operating. Remember earlier we said the Ephesian church had its fair share of challenges with unity? There was so much natural division in their community, so much reason for people to divide and band together in tribes, not that dissimilar to American Christianity in 2024. So it's 
extra meaningful for Paul to push this concept that we have to maintain unity. We have to work at it. Across his letters to the churches, Paul actually has quite a bit to say about unity. Look at what he writes in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Y'all, as Christians, we are called to be one body of Christ, united by one Holy Spirit. That means Bible church evangelicals and Methodists operate in unity. That means Gen Z and Gen X operating in unity. It means singles and marrieds and students and retirees operating in unity. And it means Christians who lean a little bit more conservative and Christians who lean a little bit more progressive also operating in unity. Now, this is really important, y'all. There is a difference between unity and uniformity. To experience the unity of the Spirit We don't all have to be the same. There's room for differences. That's why in this Kingdom Citizen series, we haven't been trying to prescribe for you exactly what to think. Our goal has never been to tell you how to vote. Our purpose has been to be extra clear on what does God's word say and how do we remain committed and obedient to it. If we can get better in how we think of ourselves as citizens of heaven and citizens of America at the same time, and then you and I take that in our various directions based on our life experiences and our passions, but we continue to grow in unity together, then we've accomplished our purpose. And by the way, this isn't just what we want for you as Parkway Church. This is so important to God's heart. Look at how Jesus prayed for his disciples in John chapter 17. Before he goes to the cross and joins the Father in heaven, he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them, even as you loved me. Do you see that? One of the most important things Jesus prayed over his followers was that we would be one. And I love that last line there, that our unity is the greatest witness to the watching world. What has the greatest impact on people that are far from God right now to understand the love of Jesus? It's not your perfect airtight gospel presentation. It's God's church, the beautiful bride of Christ, operating in love and unity and holding out true, genuine life in the midst of a world that's dying. But sadly, we tend to see the opposite among God's people. Look at the American church lately, and you'll see a people that's quick to fracture and fragment, Christ followers that knowingly or unintentionally sow seeds of discord through their community. They're drawn to drama. They pit people against each other. They act competitively or easily threatened in relationships. And who of us doesn't often struggle with sometimes assuming the worst about somebody else or jumping to assumptions when there's a misunderstanding? Instead, Paul instructs for us to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And that bond of peace can function like super glue or duct tape or or denture adhesive maybe. (laughs) You just apply a little bit and things stay together. Nothing's going anywhere. Some of you are particularly wired and gifted at this. Your personality is is all about creating and maintaining peace in relationships. But I want you to see there's a difference between just keeping the peace, which can be a, a passive byproduct of not wanting to rock the boat, versus actually creating peace, being a peacemaker. When you actively nurture and maintain peace in the community around you. You calm down dramatic situations and you you speak reason and wisdom into overly emotional situations and you help prevent 
fracturing and division. Y'all, when, when all five of these characteristics come together, they create, they create a beautiful picture. What results when God's people start walking in the way of Ephesians 4 and act intentionally about how we treat each other? The result is we begin to operate like a healing community moving out into the world around us, like balm to a wound or aloe to a throbbing sunburn. We can offer healing and restoration to a culture that's longing for genuine life. And we can start to have an eternal impact bringing God's love and righteousness into our culture and society. Because the fact is, it's no mistake that we're surrounded by a watching world that's looking for hope and truth. In that same John 17 passage we read earlier, Jesus also prays this over the church. He says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So there it is, plain as day, Parkway Bible Church. You are not of this world. Your citizenship is somewhere else. Your home is with the Father in heaven. And someday, you're going to get to reside there for an eternity. But in the meantime, until then, God has you right where you are, and it's not by accident. That's why it's so important for us to treat each other intentionally, to learn to be a blessing in all of our relationships where we live, work, and play. Here at Parkway, we care a lot about impacting people in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our families, and everywhere else positively for the sake of Jesus. We're even offering that seminar-style cohort Rachel told you about earlier to work on those practical skills where we can increase our passion and care for those around us that don't know Jesus. And you can check that out as a part of the Parkway Institute. But I would say to you, if you yourself maybe would not say with certainty today that you have a relationship with Jesus as your Savior, if you maybe have not experienced the life-changing salvation offered by his sacrifice on the cross to pay for your sins, then that's the most important thing for you to consider today. We talked about the church operating as a source of healing in the world, but you need to know today that the blood of Jesus offers healing to your heart and soul. That Isaiah passage we read earlier about the the gentle lamb being led to slaughter, a few lines beforehand it reads this, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So would you make that decision to trust Jesus today? Our prayer team would love to pray with you at the end of the service, to process out what that kind of decision could look like for you. So let's review what we saw today. We saw that kingdom people reflect humble attitudes. Kingdom people remain gentle under stress. Kingdom people demonstrate patience when provoked. Kingdom people bear with each other out of love. And kingdom people preserve unity as a priority. People of Parkway, let's let's go out from here into the world this week and let's take care of each other and treat one another with biblical love and unity. And you know, all of this is possible when we put our trust in God alone because only he rules and only he reigns eternal over everything. Would you pray with me? God, we worship you and we do offer that glory and honor towards you. We give you so much praise and worship today. You are the only king in our lives and you have offered us salvation to pay the penalty for our sin in a way that we never could have paid for ourselves. So Lord, changed by your blood, the blood of Jesus, would you just inspire us how we can treat each other 
in this biblical way we've talked about today to become that healing and restoring community that will change the world around us. We love you, Lord. We look to you and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.